I remember it was one late night. I'd been here all day, got here at 7.30. It was 10, 11 o'clock, I'm going home. And I walk, I try to be real quiet going by his room because he's asleep. And I walked by and he, he said, good night, Dad. And he had waited all night to say good night to me. And I just, my broke, I, I, I cry almost every time I think about it because I realized that, wow, here I am saving the world, but I was losing my family and didn't know. Well, everyone, welcome to the Olive School of Ministry podcast. We are super excited today because we have our senior pastor, we have our Olive School Ministry president, Pastor Tim Carscatting, with us today. So we're super excited. This is the first actual video uh, podcast that we've, I mean, we've recorded other ones, but this is the first most important one that we have to do. Um, and so... Here in a however long we decide to release the other ones, uh, we'll have a few in the chamber to release as well with some pretty exciting people. But today we get to talk to Pastor Tim about Olive School of Ministry, why we're doing the podcast, um, how Olive kind of was birthed, and some of the prophetic about it, and then a little bit about Pastor Tim's life as well, which everyone wants to know <laughs> about his life. The secret things that no one else gets to know about. Like, did y'all know that? He was a professional table tennis ping pong uh, player. I don't know, professional. He was professional. <laughs> I invited him one day in a youth building. He hit a ping pong ball at me, and that thing no. was scary. It no. had some spin on it. So, anyway, Pastor Tim, we're so excited for you to be here. So Glad um, to be here. It's, it's a blessing. He's a busy man. He's about to head off to spend some time with the family. So we are privileged to have you here. Um, so talking about Olive, uh, there's a lot of prophetic history about Olive School of Ministry and kind of how it came to be. Um, and, and I mean, then y'all were doing, even before this, y'all were doing cults, and we still do cults. It's just changed to Olive at night, right. which can be somewhat confusing. But right. we technically have two schools. That's right. We have our Olive at night classes, um, and then we have our Olive School of Ministry, which is the full ministry school. Right. And so um, tell us a little bit about the prophetic history for just the training center, I guess. Well, I think, you know, with what we do, our hope is to build what we call an apostolic center. And what we've been doing throughout our ministry, I've been here 26 years now, senior pastor. Prior to that, I was the youth pastor. And then prior to that, I was just a normal person in the congregation, just serving the Lord here. And I, I think that's what gave me the heart for equipping saints was the fact I know what it's like to work a secular job, come to church, you know, do the stuff, and, and then still find places of ministry. Where do I work? How do I work? What do I do in the kingdom? One of our first uh, mottos, our first uh, mission statements was equipping the saints, everyone a minister. That was my passion. Because mm -hmm. I just, I struggled with the whole thing of growing up and the separation of clergy and laity. And I think that, you know, that's been around a long time. You're a, you're a theologian you understand how far back that goes, you know, to the Roman times, where the, the common Christian was left out mm -hmm. of the opportunity to yeah. learn, uh, couldn't read, uh, literacy was, was delegated to the clergy, and so there was a very difficult thing. And for me, when I look at that history, I think that's just not right. And I think that the, it's still there. Yeah. E even in the church as a whole, we still see it's the like a mindset. Right. And we see a separation. And so when I was young minister, because I came out of the congregation. I, I, I mean, I went to Bible college and all that, but the fact was Bible college didn't, the college I went to, it didn't really help me a whole lot. It didn't give me a lot of practical. Yeah. It gave me a lot of knowledge, which I needed theologically, but it didn't give me a lot of practical how to do this. And so I had to kind of learn that on my own. But as sitting in a congregation and seeing needs everywhere, I mean, just seeing things undone in the ministry, uh, needs not being met that need to be done in the kingdom, and I thought, Lord, this person, whoever the clergy is, they don't have enough time in the day yes. to serve. And so, I mean, you may even speak to, you know, um, uh, in Acts where they, where they appoint those those people to do the what we'd call the menial jobs. Yeah. I don't call them the menial jobs. I think they're very important. I think we call it servant leadership. You serve, and, and it's, it's leadership. Yeah. Well, and the funny thing is in Acts, I mean, you know, the first few chapters, 
all of the miraculous, powerful things are surrounding the apostles, right? right. Well, then when they appoint these deacons, every, they become the focus of the story. And yeah. Stephen's doing powerful signs That's and right. wonders and Philip's being the evangelist. That's and it's right. like, whoa, whoa, whoa. These That's lay right. people are now carrying the glory and power of the Lord. And so it's kind of interesting. A lot of people don't notice the shift from the inner circle of the apostles to right. the people doing the work of the ministry. And a lot of people say, well, they, you know, they made a mistake. They, should, they didn't make a mistake. The apostles understood that we have to step back and focus on more big picture things. That's right. Because there was probably, even then, the mindset of, well, you were the ones who, you're the anointed ones. You have to do it. And so the Bible shows clearly, like, no, the people who were serving tables and making sure the widows got what they deserved, and they carried the power of God to do the work of ministry, like the evangelizing and meeting the needs of the people. And the apostles stepped back to really consume themselves with reading the word and prayer, is what it says. And so... Uh, that's the mindset that we still have in the church sometimes is, you know, and, and our church is a little different because you, you throw a tennis ball in the crowd and you're going to hit someone who can preach. <laughs> that's right. And so which it is, is true. It's just a good problem no. to have. And I, that was my goal. That was yeah. the goal in the beginning is to equip people. When you read, he, you know, Ephesians 4.12, when it says to do the work of the ministry, is yeah. the fivefold does that. One of the reasons the fivefold gets burned out many times is because they're the ones that are having to do all the work at the ministry. Yeah. And when you study that work of the ministry to building up, to edifying of the church, it actually lists in there menial, menial tasks, the things that, that, that make everything happen. And if you own a company, uh, you understand the menial task is the foundation of everything that goes on in that company. Yeah. If we don't do those, then it doesn't work. Paul decrees that in 1 Corinthians 12 when he talks about the, the different parts of the body of Christ, and he talks about the lesser ones and the greater ones. But nonetheless, we have to have every part yes. of our body. I, you know, my big toe is very important for my balance. Yes. You know, there are certain things that happen. And so for me, when I was starting out as pastoring, I came out of the congregation. I mean, it literally, I started here just serving the Lord. You know, I, I had a call when I was a teenager to prophesy, to preach, and be a pastor and all that. But when I came here, I just I just found knees. When somebody said, "What do I do in the kingdom?" Well, Jesus tells us what He says: heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out you know demons, uh, heal the leper. What those are all clear. Those, yeah. That's for everybody, regardless if you have a title or not a title. So I knew that. But also, I kept seeing things that were undone, and I just started doing them. I didn't a lot of times I didn't even ask if there's a table need to be cleaned. I cleaned the table. And so many people want a job description and want to be told everything to do in the kingdom. <laughs> When in fact, there's needs everywhere. Yeah. You know, I started in ministry when I was a kid in nursing homes. You know, there was no opportunity as a kid uh, to minister anywhere, but man, the nursing home has tons of needs. Yeah. So we would go every week and I'd, I'd sing and, and uh, we'd go to the rooms and pray, we'd preach. You'd sing? Yeah, well, as a, as a, with a choir. I didn't, <laughs> do it by my, I didn't do it by myself. Look, I, wanted to, I wanted them to let me come back. But uh, we would go to each room, and, and that was it. You know, that was where I kind of birthed what I was doing. And, and I, wherever opportunity came, we did that. So that's kind of the, the model I came out of. So when I'm sitting here in the congregation, because I've been at Christian Center since its inception, uh, and me and Susan, my wife, and we were watching this, and I just started serving. I just didn't, I don't know, there's, there's just something, as a Baptist was raised, you're taught to serve. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a question whether you do that or not. Everybody serves. And I, I do appreciate that about the Baptist church. Sometimes they burn people out because they make them mm -hmm. overserve. But for a minister, what happens, they, there's a term called a hireling that happens in the church where you pay somebody to do all the work. Well, that, that tends to happen with clergy many times. The, the, the people go, well, we give our tithe. We do all that. We'll pay just, someone to do it. That's right. Well, and and I, I say this, hirelings are, are, are not really, they don't choose to be, they're made. <clears throat> The people make them become that because they don't do the work of the ministry. So if, when there's something not being done, the minister feels like he's got to do it. In in my experience, and maybe I'm you know this is me, hirelings are almost like the they're disciples. I honestly, if you're making a hireling, it's because we're going to pull you in a little closer. And so like I was, my first job at a church was the groundskeeper. Yeah. I was a hireling, that's, that's, but it wasn't because they just need someone to do a job. They saw something on me. And they said, we just need Scott to be a little closer so yeah. we can watch him and help him develop. And I cut grass 40 hours a week. I mowed, I weed eated, I sprayed, I blew leaves. Mm -hmm. That was my first job in the ministry. Yeah. And I did it for two years. Yeah. And so, uh, but the whole point was they hired me because they said, we want Scott to come in a little closer. And yeah. this is the way to do it. Right. 
you know, and so whatever, whatever it takes. You're right, and I, and we do that sometimes. Is in, in the fivefold, we we want to see the hunger of the person. Yeah. Are, are they really <laughs> passionate to do this? Uh, what's their motive? I've had people come up to me. I'm called to ministry. They'll tell me, you know, I see you preach. That's what I'm called to. And yeah. I said, well, <laughs> you don't, mom. you don't know. <laughs> that's the gravy. You know, yeah. the the hard work comes long before that. But the equipping the saints to make everybody a minister, that, that was just my passion. Mm -hmm. And so we began to train people, equip people. I mean, I'm not an academian. I mean, I love to study, and I, I did all I could pass college. And I did all that. But the fact was that just wasn't my passion. I'm a doer. Yeah. Even when I was in college, I, I had more attention on the window outside, uh, you know, what was going on out there. I remember that guy, uh, Gaines, he does the, I forget the Chip. name. Chip. Chip. He, he, you know, he graduated from Baylor University, which is a very difficult university yeah. to go to. But he said, he said his interest was the guy mowing out in the yard. He said he literally would sit by the window and said, I wish I was out there mowing rather than sitting in this class. Yeah. Of course, he passed the classes, and you learn to learn in college. I think that's what you're supposed to do, <laughs> at least. You learn to learn. But the fact is that I'm a doer, and but you have the foundational knowledge that tells you what to do. Yeah. That's why I think the all part is a big component of that where we're, why are you doing what you do yeah. so like when somebody comes to church and especially a spirit-filled church and they've never been in that environment and you know, everybody's raising their hands well why are they raising their hands yeah. you know why are they doing that do that what well, all of a sudden they're starting to do this and they don't know why they're doing that and, and i think that's an empty walk at times i want to have the revelation of why what's the theological foundation for that why do we raise our hands why do we lift our hands yeah. and i think that knowledge base really helps so we started to, you know, train the best we could. We had classes all the time. I noticed this. The more teaching and equipping I did with people, the less menial things I had to do with the people because I gave them the tools in their tool belt to do what they need to do, not just me, all the teachers I used here. I've never been one to be the teacher. I've always believed that, hey, train up others. If you, you know, There's just so many teachers. ways to do that because everybody has a different way of seeing things mm -hmm. and do that. So in 2006... Fast forward, for, you know, 20-something years. But in 2006, 10 years, I should say, uh, the Lord said, start a school of prophets, you know. And I thought, wow, okay, God, school of prophets, that's pretty big. That's a big term, you know. And I studied it, and uh, we see that in the Old Testament. Uh, heresy hunters don't like that term. They say, we don't see that in the New Testament, and I get all that. But the fact is, we're just equipping people to hear God. Yeah. I mean, that's really all we do with our school of prophets. And so I started on my own, and uh, just me teaching and started my first class, probably had about 40, 50 people come, you know, and it just kept growing, it kept growing. It got to be, we were having over 100 plus students, on, you know, coming every week. And I was like, oh my gosh, this thing <laughs> is taking a life of its own, yeah. and it went way beyond what I, I had anticipated. And that's when I said I had to get pulled back. We also started noticing, uh, when I just taught prophets, okay, prophetic teaching i started noticing i have a lot of problems with the people uh because they hadn't they didn't have foundations mm -hmm. in certain areas so like they had strongholds in their heart bitterness anger whatever so i teach them how to prophesy well they became angry prophets yeah you know and i i was <laughs> like oh, wait wait what's going on so we started backing up and we started doing some foundational teachings uh, inner healing uh experiencing the father's embrace, father's was embrace. we one. started one of our first class matter of fact that was a requirement. We made that a requirement to, to come to the prophetic yeah. class because we realized strongholds affected the prophetic yeah. and everything they're doing. And so that started, a, 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 I don't know, an evolution, I'd use that term, of the way we began to form the schools, the night schools, what we were doing. We, we started adding more theological courses, more foundational courses to make sure that they had those foundations to understand why we prophesy. Mm -hmm. Okay, the fact that you can hear, you get a gift. Okay, anybody can hear because the Bible says we can do that, but the fact is, why do I hear and what do I hear for and how do I deliver what I hear? Yes. And do I deliver, is it is it biblical? Is everything I'm saying yes. in the Word of God? Well, if I don't know the Word of God, then what am I prophesying? I'm not saying you can't still be used that way. Jesus had the whole guy, remember the disciples were mad at the guy out there preaching by himself. Yeah. He hadn't been to the school of Jesus. And they were like, hey, this dude's bad. And Jesus, well, they're, they're not against us, they're for us. You know, he gave that 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 exclusion, I guess you could say. It wasn't the best way, I don't think, but it was a way. Yeah. And the gospel can still get Paul, same thing. Hey, they're preaching out of selfish ambition. He says, well, 
they're preaching Jesus, you know, we're just going to leave yeah. it at that. And I think we can get too edgy on our theology in the point that we want to be, uh, you know, I, I was, I'm going to be honest with you, when I came out of Bible college, I was a God's Gestapo on theology. And I was, were you a heresy hunter? Oh, I was, man. And I was just like, I was watching TBN and taking names and notes and, you know, how wrong they were and all this kind of stuff. I got into arguments with my brother, who's a Baptist pastor, a theologian, a Hebrew Greek scholar. We would just argue for hours and hours and hours on theology. And, and I realized it hurt our relationship, ultimately. We never agreed with each other. <laughs> I never won him over, and he never won me over. You know, I was I was in, I was into faith and and you know experiencing God. Yeah. He was all about head knowledge, cessation theology. So we were just on different pages. But it helped me because I needed to know what he thought and why he thought what he mm -hmm. thought and where he got his foundation from and why he believed what he believed. And I think that's what we 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 do it all if now. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But I I think my the genesis of what we're doing was mainly to equip the saints. And this, this, um, yeah, the the desire to equip the saints. And because when you equip, you're really discipling at some Absolutely. level. Absolutely. Okay? Because we think discipling is just come and sit on a Sunday mm -hmm. and listen to a message, and that's not. Okay, discipling is, I'm going to teach you to do what we do, that's right. what I do, so you can do it. And, I mean, that's how the church grows. Um, you don't grow by being a, a pew potato on Sunday mornings, <laughs> coming in and listening and just leaving and going home and that's saying, right. well, pastor's out there saving the city. That's right. Um, in fact, you know, I, I was uh, <clears throat> a friend of mine who's a pastor in Florida, went to a seminar a few years ago, and they said, here's what your cong uh, your congregation members expect you to do a week as a pastor, and it adds up to 140 hours <laughs> of work a week. And so it's, it's that mindset, uh, which, like you mentioned earlier, came in really early in the church in about the third century, and they started formalizing the institution and creating that division between the clergy, religious leaders, and the laity. And we're just trying to bridge that gap because right. it wasn't there in the beginning. That's right. It was never there. I mean, Jesus chose fishermen and, you know, tax collectors and just everyday people to be his, um, his, his, his disciples, his leaders. Um, and so that's what we're trying to break is that mentality. But you said apostolic center like we want to be an apostolic center what is an apostolic yeah. center and, and that's probably a controversial title the apostolic hub training center yeah, i think there's different terms we can mm -hmm. use oh, for absolutely. it I, my main goal is you know the foundation of the gospel is built on the apostolic and prophetic the apostles mm -hmm. and prophets and to me it's a fathering anointing it's, it's an equipping it's seeing the future yeah. If I don't, if I'm not, if I, apostolic to me is I'm looking to the future, whether I'm here or not, we're going to build this thing yeah. for another generation, yes. if not my own, but for the generation to come. Sure, I want to experience it. I don't want to miss out on anything. I'm, I what we call a FOMO, right? Fear yeah. of missing out. I don't want to miss out on anything in, that God's mm -hmm. doing, but the fact is, if I'm going to have the heart of the Father, and when, when Paul talks about what it means to be apostle, he talks about perseverance. Yeah. And really, it is persevering. And I, I think for me, uh, I think survival is probably a better way of saying I'm here rather than, you know, <laughs> achievement. Because I've had to survive a lot of trials, a lot of hardships to get where we are. I think that Barna says the average 50 pastors quit every day. So you have this, this falling away in the ministry because, one, you're trying to do it all yourself. Yes. And that happens. Burn and for out. me as a, a young pastor, I was that way. Oh, my gosh. When I became pastor, I was 35 years old, had kids, you know, I was college, da da da. But nonetheless, I was spending 14, 15, 16, 18 hours a day here at this building. And I just was, I thought the harder I work, the better this ministry can grow. And I was doing everything by myself. And what I did was I built a culture that Pastor Tim will do everything. Yeah. I don't have to do anything. You know, we just show up. He does everything. And and I want you to understand the human nature is if you will do that, they'll let they'll you. Let you. <laughs> and then they expect you. That's right. And it became that you way. Your own prison. And then I had leaders that believed that as well. Mm. I, I I remember when I was burnt, oh, absolutely. I was burned out counseling. I was doing, you know, four or five hours of counseling a day and and I went to my elders and I said, Man, I, I gotta get some help. I'm dying here. And and they looked at me and said, Well, that's your job. You know, in other words, just you got to do it. And so then I sucked it up and started doing it more. I had a, an awakening. It's a kind of an inside story. Uh, my son Jacob, who, uh, you know, just we, were, we had a great relationship growing up. He did, growing up with me. And, 
I remember it was one late night. I'd been here all day, got here at 730. It was 10, 11 o'clock. I'm going home. And I walk, I try to be real quiet going by his room because he's asleep. And I walked by and he, he said, good night, dad. And he had waited all night mm. to say good night to me. Yeah. And I just, my broke, I, I, I cry almost every time I think about it because I realized that, wow, here I am saving the world, but I was losing my family mm. and didn't know it. And so I had to pause and I said, Susan, we got to shift. Yeah. I mean, I got to find one help. And, and at that time I was the staff, I was it, I was the staff. And, and, uh, I said, we got to hire children's pastor. We got to hire a youth pastor. And so the, the elders that every year would come to me, want to give you a pay raise. And I said, no, I said, don't give me a pay raise. I said, we need to hire. I said, we've got to find ways to get more help here because otherwise I'm going to die. And this church is only going to be as strong as I am. Yeah. I mean, really, and that happens to a lot of ministries. Yeah. It's, it's centered. And, and the, what well, the model is, it's a Moses model. Yeah. And you sit there and everybody stands in line and comes to you. That's what the model is. And we don't want that here. We want that everybody's a part of that. So that when, when, you, when you create an atmosphere, an apostolic center, you're training people that they do the work of the ministry, but also that they can prophesy, yeah. they can pray, they can pray for the sick, they can do that. We can do all these things, and so therefore the weight is not on that. It's distributed one against the team. Abs absolutely. And I mean, if you know anything about Olive, is our whole school is because we have a team. That's right. If there's no team, there's no school. That's right. And we'll talk about that more, but you know, I, it's important because the App Stock Center is essentially we're bringing people in. Our desire is to train you to where. If need be, you could plant a church and lead a church. Yes. And and so we want there to be copies of Pastor Tim and John and Pastor Jimmy or me or whoever running around the church to where if we're not there, we can do it. And, I mean, there, there are Sundays when there's no pastor <laughs> on campus and things still run amazing. Like it does. And, um, you know, I, I just, it's, it's such a – being involved in other ministries and different types, I mean, it really is – it's a mind shift because – if there's any competitiveness in you, um, then what happens is it's going to be hard for you to champion other people That's to right. rise up. That's and right. so when you get the revelation of it's not about me, it's not about my ministry, right. it's about the body of Christ, and it's about Jesus getting what he desires, you can step back and you can say, I don't have to be the one to speak. Um, I want this person to speak, and I need this to speak because they're carrying a message, and they're and you don't have to carry everything like you're saying. And so, so an apostolic center is a training center where we're building mature believers. We're, they're coming in, we're building them, we're we're discipling them, and then we either send them into areas in our church to be ministers, like hey, go lead this department, go, you know, like Terry Hale who leads the intercession department or Miss Karen Hudgens who or no Miss Karen leads the intercession department and Terry who leads the healing and deliverance That's and. Right. Um, and then we have, you know, Ray Saller who leads the men's and right. Sherry Free, the women's. And so we have all these leaders that we've empowered, and, and you're very good at scary good, <laughs> scary good at saying run with your dream. Yeah, yeah. And that's a scary thing if you've been yeah. under a lot of structure and, um, you know, like tight walls, so to speak, when someone says just run with it, and you're like, but – but what do you what do you want? What do you need? What do you yeah. and you're like, I just be you. Yeah. And it's a really freedom it can be a scary thing if you're not used to it. And um I had a friend, he's a pastor, he's an amazing friend, a uh, great, great uh minister, and he uh he texted he, you know, we were talking one day, uh, I think over lunch actually, and he said, How many how many speakers do you guys have at Christian Center? And I was like, Oh gosh, let me count. <laughs> one, two, three. And I said, Gosh, at least a dozen. I said, At least. I know yeah. I'm missing people, at least twelve. And he goes, Man, how big are y'all? And I told, him, I told him about how big we were, and you know, this this is a church of like a thousand. And I'm like, well, how many of you guys? He goes, uh, we got me. It was me, me, and you know, the main pastor. And I was like, man, that's a lot of work, and so and a lot of you know, you carry that. But it's a so, culture that gets built. It is. It is. And mm -hmm. I want to say this. Let me add to, to this about the center. We've been doing this so long now that I got kids that came through the ministry. Uh, families that came through. They've been with us all along the way, came to all the training, all the equipping, and then they left. And I want to say this. I, I have tons of testimonies. When they leave, they become leaders everywhere they go. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, I had, I had another minister who noticed that. He noticed the people he knew here, and then he noticed when they left and all that became leaders. He said, y'all have built something there that actually know how to build leadership. 
Yeah. And, and, it's, and to me, our motto is servant leadership. It's not just leading. Because a lot of people say, well, I just want to teach, or I just want to do this. I said, well, that's just not ministry. Yeah. Ministry is everything. Because when it talks about equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry, how can a fivefold teach somebody to do that if they don't do it themselves or have not done it themselves? Mm -hmm. And so you and I and everybody here on staff, uh, almost I think everybody here has worked uh, a secular job. Uh, we didn't we didn't like leave college seminary go straight into ministry mm -hmm. we all worked in what a real life i would call a real life i think this is real life too but they we we did what it takes to go out there and know what it's like to work eight ten hours a day and then come and and then be involved in a ministry because yep. i'm very cognizant of people's time family and i don't try to put on people especially the people in the congregation too much because i'm always thinking like that because i've been there before I think sometimes leaders in churches will put too much on a, on a congregate yeah. and ask them. But I think I had, a, I had a consultant come in and look at our ministry, and that's when he said, you built the Moses model, you got to shift. And that's one thing that it was a, it was a rude awakening to me because I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought giving everything and giving all uh, was the answer. But when it was all me and didn't even know that probably I was getting affirmation from that. That wasn't my goal. I just see what needs and I would do them. Mm -hmm. But when the fact was it, was, it was eating at me and to the point, and I wasn't equipping anybody. And what we were seeing was potential leaders leave the congregation because they would like, why am I here? And you know, some people, you know, we have people in our house, if they weren't doing right. something, right. they'd leave because they're doers. That's right. <clears throat> like you are, they're, they're a doer. And they're like, that's I just, right. I, I need to do, I need to serve, I need to do this. And so, yeah, and that's an issue. It's it's funny, we admire, It's it, I think it's an unhealthy thing in American culture, but like we admire the people who like, they poured their life out mm -hmm. and it destroyed everything. We're like, man, they gave it all. I mean, but like John G. Lake is a great example. Mm -hmm. Um, and people might hear this story and they'd be like, wow, I admire that. He went to Africa with his first wife. They had like seven kids. She died on the mission field of starvation yeah. because he was so busy ministering and yeah. traveling and they were so busy feeding the poor people that she died not taking care of her own needs. So when she died and he had to move back to the North America, his whole relationship with all of his kids was destroyed because they realized dad gave his life to the church and destroyed us and so on and the, but people will hear that and admire it and it's like it's it's such a warped mentality because i mean that's not that's that's no. that's wrong right wisdom, well jesus said wisdom is proven in his children okay so wisdom is that you did it the why the way wisdom would tell you to do it yeah. and you have the fruits of it in your children and and the fruits of those that you sowed into it don't have to be your physical children it can be your spiritual children as well and for me, I have to say, I know so many pastors and minister friends whose kids, none of them are serving the Lord. None. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are, they are burning for God and doing miracle signs and wonders, and their kids are as lost as they can be, have no desire to be in ministry or be around ministry, mm -hmm. and some of them don't even serve the Lord. And to me, that, that, I, I, that was my heart's cry. Like I said, with that little encounter with my son Jacob, and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I got I to gotta minister in my house as yeah. well and made sure that my kids know the Lord and know his ways and then also that they have their portion. And I never forced my kids to do anything as far as you're going to church today, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. I never did that. And they have thanked me as adults, we have two adult children, three now, and they've all thanked me that I never did that to them. And, and it was not, we never even had to say as church, they wanted to be there. Yeah. They wanted to be involved. Both my older sons, um, they were like, what can I do? What, what can I do to serve? And they had the same servant's heart because they saw it modeled in the house and they grew up in that house of that modeling. Mm -hmm. So it became part of their, their DNA. And for me now, the foundation with all the, the, the spirit of the age that we're in right now, we're in the information age, obviously, and to me, to train people and equip people properly in the Word of God is so critical. And I think this is something I'd like you, you to speak to because as we move forward, we had our night school ministry. We called it and Crowns. This is 2006. Y'all started yeah, that? Yeah, 2006. So Crowns of Life, <laughs> uh, we started uh, the, all of the, the day school in 21, right? If I remember right, uh, fall of 81, 21. Is that correct? We're in our third school. We're, this is yeah. our third year. Yeah, this, yeah that's right. 21, 22, COVID 23. messes that's up right. my, <laughs> my years. But we did it there. And uh, I and you, Scott, and if y'all don't know Scott, uh, you do because you're watching this podcast. But 
uh, Scott's heart was to have that foundation. He loves knowledge. He loves the ways of God. And so he, he had a heart to go to seminary, and I appreciated that. But at I, this time, I was I, a teacher right. at Captain, Captain Tree. Tree High School. That's correct. He was a public school teacher. So wait, we're going back to 2018. <laughs> okay. Okay. So because at this time, yeah. it's 2018. Yeah. I'm a public school teacher. Right. Well, we started to... talking about this idea. Uh, uh, I don't know, Mayor, when we really started talking about the idea of going full-time school and uh, starting the Olive School uh, as far as the day oh, students. Oh, I wasn't even, well, at least in my mind, I, me and Camila were trying to get back to Columbia to be on the mission field. I know. This was just our yeah. stop, you know? Well, I'm fast-forwarding then. I'm, I'm, getting, <laughs> I'm getting back to where our school was. I, and I remember because I, I found my sermon when I launched it. Um, it was in the spring of 2021. So when we, we launched the Aleph word, the, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, we launched that idea yeah. and, and began to lay the foundation for that. But then, you know, your heart and, and you, you spent your time studying and preparing yourself. This is something that this is where I think for us using all the gifts in the house was yeah. critical. You know, that's just not my DNA. That's just I, I'm, a, I'm a doer. I mean, I understand the word and I love the word and I love theology and I love all that. But as far as systematically laying it out line upon line, what needs to be taught to a yeah. student, that I, you know, I kind of just, whatever the Holy Spirit tells me to do, that's what I tend yeah. to do. That's, that's been my MO because, again, that was, just, I didn't, I wasn't a good student in college. I mean, I did college, made my A's and B, I had 3.5 <laughs> whatever GPA. Yeah. But I was like, let, what do I, what does this professor want? Let me give them what they want yeah. and I'm going to get out of here. I didn't take advantage of what was being put into me at times. And that, that's just, there's, I don't know what the reason is for that. Maybe I was ADD. I don't know. But the whole. I think everybody has a different gifting. Maybe. But, I, and I, and people wonder how I do what I do because I'm not, quote, an academician like that. But the fact is God gifts and gives different yeah. callings for everybody. And my heart is an activator. My heart is who can I activate? How many people can I activate and do that? So like when people come to my class, they start coming to my prophetic class. They go, man, ever since I started coming here, I'm hearing God. I, I dream all the time. I do all these different things. And so sometimes things are caught more than taught as well. I, I think you still teach people, but they catch something in the spirit as well. They catch uh, catch the vision. They catch the oh, idea. Yeah, impartation. So like for me, uh, Mario Murillo in the 80s, I, I would watch him work in the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom and word of prophecy, and I go, man, I just want it. And I would listen to his tapes uh, every night every single night, and I would fast forward past the sermon and get to the, the altar ministry where he was using the gifts, and I would just listen and listen. Now, I listened to all his sermons many times, but I loved that part because there was something inside of me that said, you're called to I do call this, it and it just began to grow in me, and so I knew that I could, I could impart that yeah. at some level to people where they'd have that same hunger yeah. for that desire to do that, and I think everybody needs to hear God. I think oh, first, yeah. first Corinthians 14 is it's very clear. the foundation clear. of our entire church and school. Absolutely. We, and, we and, equip you to hear. And, and Paul said that, you know, you should mm-hmm. desire this above all things. Uh, you should have desired to prophesy. And so I, I took that at its, at its face value and said, let's do that. Yeah. But I think now, with especially with this generation that you're, you were seeing now, with all the information, this, this little thing right here, I mean, it's smarter than any seminary. You know, I should say smarter. It has more information. Oh, yeah, stash chat or, GPT. That's right. You know, you got, you know. <laughs> it has all those things, but the fact is, uh, do you know how to apply those things? And I think that's what our school does. It gives application. And I remember the first year students you took, and, and I'm going to let you tell how you come up with the curriculum and everything. But the first year you took them to Columbia, and I, you know, you guys do most of the teaching. I don't hardly do any. I don't do any <laughs> uh, other than what they listen to me on Sunday morning and Wednesdays. But um, when I when you w- we went to Columbia and I watched them minister, and I and I watched the maturity and I watched the foundations. They knew what they were doing, why they were doing it. They understood what the focus of what they were. And I and I, I was an awakening to me. I was like, oh my God, this thing works, you know, at that level. Because when I was doing it at night, you know, it was once a week, and uh, you saw growth over time, months and years. You saw growth. And here we saw in a three, four month period, somebody go from, I don't want to say ground zero, but almost ground zero to be in, a, a, in ministry. And to me, that's the early church. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about guys hung around Jesus, but yeah. even the early guys, look at Cornelius. 
and people like that and who just all of a sudden yeah. boom they're having visions and they're having encounters well, with god you know if i always tell people when they ask our school i said it's it's the biblical model of discipleship because yeah. the reality is is you know jesus had the rabbi model the rabbi model was you lived with your teacher yeah. you lived every day you're with them you know you'd have breaks you know you know peter go back with his family and whatever um, but you'd have breaks, but you pretty much live day and night with your with your rabbi, with your teacher. And so what happens at Aleph, and it's really cool because you get this little family that forms over the year, you know, from August to May, a family forms, and there's tension, there's conflict, there's growth, there's, you know, you learn about each other, you know, you receive the gift um, of the, the it, you know, because I believe that every person like you and like Pat John and you know me, we carry gifts that is Christ in us. It's, it's an aspect of Christ that no one else carries. And so what happens is as you, as you spend time with me, that gift gets imparted to you, yeah. right? And so what happens is we're giving the gift of ourselves. And, you know, Paul even says that, I long to be with you so I can impart That's to right. you the gift, That's right? The gift of his life. That's and right. so, so there's this gift, these, so much of it is impartation as well as teaching, but it's just the reality of, intense intentional discipleship over almost a year of being here being around here we go to lunch together we take trips together john's the king of spontaneous trips to places and you know they all jump in and go and have fun mm -hmm. and it's in those moments where real conversations happen and real questions right. happen and and so many of those moments are what mark a lot of the students and said well you know you said this and it's like I didn't say that. No, on the in the car ride here, you told me this, and it was like, oh, okay, that's important. And so, that's you know the nature of what we're doing when we're building an Abstalk Center. That's right. You're just pouring ourselves into people and discipleship, and and our heart is not that you become like me, but that you become who God created you to be, and whatever of my life yeah. is imparted to you and help you. In the well, journey, I think your so birth in Kononia, which is the fellowship, yeah. which is what the early church had, like you said. The Bible says that they, in Acts, that they, they broke bread daily. And that means you not just ate together, but you were talking the things of God. Rick Joyner always used to say that the early church, uh, theologically, were much more advanced than most seminarians today. Because what? They grew up in the synagogue. They grew up in the temple. Mm -hmm. Their parents taught them at home as well. So you didn't just, you just didn't go to you know, synagogue every week. You sat at the house every day. Yeah. And you learn, uh, even some rabbinical studies show that if you're going to be a priest by age five, you'd memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. So this is where they, they were just pouring into them uh, at that time. So when Jesus would give the, the, the Jewish uh, you know, uh, concepts, they totally understood that yeah. because they were that. Now, the Gentiles had to learn that, and that's you know we see that after 300 A.D., everything shifts because we lost that foundation. Yeah. And I think right now we're trying to get that foundation. Yeah. And then the last thing would be, another thing would be the urbanization of the church, which is we are so spread out. We're so large. We live in urban cities and, and you know, some people drive here to church an hour and a half, oh, yeah. you know, or whatever. So getting them to meetings and gatherings is, is not easy. I mean, online helps. This helps right here. But the fact is the connection and community, because I don't know what you don't know unless I'm talking to you. Yes. Okay, so if you're watching this, this podcast right now and you're trying to learn, okay, well, you're learning, but what are you not learning? And, and unless I'm with you, I don't know, maybe you mistook that the wrong way. A lot of people yeah. come up to me, you know, when you preach this and this and this, and I go... I didn't, uh, I didn't say preach that. that. I didn't preach that. Wait, you know? <laughs> but but you know, I understand they can catch something, and the Holy Spirit teach them what I I gave them a concept, and the Holy Spirit went further. Yeah. But sometimes they didn't understand what I was saying, and without community, I misunderstand. That's right, completely. misunderstand. And without community, which Olive creates and 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 offers to a student, is that we're going to get with you all that you can't hide after two months. Yeah. You can't hide something after yeah. three months. If you got bitterness, <laughs> if you got anger, if you got whatever, it's going to. Am I, uh, Hannah, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. We're gonna, Hannah's we're gonna the agree. camera. She was a student last year. <laughs> so you, you'll do it. And that's what community does. Well, and, you know, it's funny because we call it the great experiment. I call all of the great experiment because we're just – and I told our first-year students that they were guinea pigs. I told our second-year students they were guinea pigs. I told these students they're guinea pigs because we're, we're just learning. And so, like, in our values, we've, they've changed. Like, we now have in our values – they weren't there originally uh, – we value discipleship, which means accountability, conflict – 
tension, confrontation, going to the deep parts of your life that you don't want to reveal. And we're going to ask you about those because that's how you grow. Didn't Jesus do that with the disciples? 100%. But look at, look at Peter when he says, oh, that's not going to happen to you. And he goes, you're not hearing from this. You're, you're thinking the ways of man. Yeah. He corrects him but, right there in the middle of that that's situation. That's how you grow. That's right. I mean, exactly. I've, the rebukes that happen, and they're so loving, even here. I say, Pastor Tim crushes you with a velvet brick. You don't even realize you're being crushed because it's so soft. And then you walk out, and like a day later, you're like, maybe that was a correction. <laughs> but, oh, well, I have a mercy gift, so thank goodness it for helps. that. Yeah. But, you know, all that's important. And, you know, we even had to put in the values again. We value challenge. Amen. Because we, you're going to feel challenge. You're going to feel over your head. You're going to feel uncomfortable. But we're there to say, we believe in you. Amen. You can do it. Amen. And so... Back well, to the history. Yeah, let's let's build this. <clears throat> so I, just, I okay. want Scott to talk about this this because Scott was struggling. I'll, I'll never forget the Wednesday night we were meeting here in the foyer for whatever reason. I can't remember. Construction. Construction was going on, and I looked at him and I saw this dark cloud over you, and you were just really struggling. Where am I? What am I supposed to be doing? I, and that's what I was hearing. As a pr prophetic person, people don't understand. I hear thoughts, and I don't hear. You know, a lot of people think I'm hearing all the evil stuff, but I'm, I'm really hearing the struggles. I'm hearing the battles that people are going through. And I said, God, what's the answer to that struggle? What can I speak life to that and build that up, build that person back up? Because, uh, you know, you can be a negative prophet and say, hey, you're discouraged. You got a dark spirit on you and you need to get that off of you. Yeah. Or you can say, uh, what's the answer to that problem? And I always say that, that, that it has to be an answer to the problem. It, it, to me, you're only doing half your job if you just tell the what's wrong. And I think that the enemy can do that. So, uh, and I had a prophetic word that night. I said, somebody started a painting or a drawing or something, and they haven't finished it. Uh, or, hadn't, or hadn't, I said, put it up. I think that's what I said. You need to put it up and remind yourself of your vision. Yeah. And then I think I prophesied over you as well. You're part of your call. And so Scott... Uh, has this story, and I've, I love this story yeah. as he shared it. So I'd like this you to is, share that so and talks about how two, we got to where two we separate are. occasions, so you okay, understand. Yeah. Okay, so the I remember is so personal. Uh, and I was a public school teacher. I mean, our plan was we're going to come from the mission field. 2015. Me and my wife moved back from Columbia. We're going to be here a couple of years, get her citizenship, and then go back to the mission field. I written I wrote my own script, right? <laughs> um, and so. Anyway, in that process, I'm, I'm really struggling. And then Pastor Tim one day says, hey, can we have lunch? I had, a, I had a dream I want to tell you about. So we're in lunch, and he says, I had a dream you went to seminary. And if Pastor Tim says you go to seminary, it's because it's the Lord, <laughs> because he's always called it seminary. And so yes. I, he didn't know, but I was actually looking with Randy Clark's school, and I was taking his classes, his uncertified uh, classes, but I switched over after that word and invested five years of my life into a word. I, I, I want people to hear this, a word that led to a five-year journey <laughs> and an investment on my end of right, a lot right. uh, for me, my family, and everything. But I knew it was the Lord, and so I started this school. I'm still working a secular job and going to school at the same time. Um, the night you saw me out in the lobby, right. I was trying to get back to Columbia. I was like, I, I don't know why I'm here, Lord. I'm, I, I'm, I was in a battle, a struggle, of just understanding my calling purpose. I felt the call to ministry so strong on me, but there was no, I'm not going to force a door open. There was no opportunity. And I was just like, go back to Columbia and be, be with the people that we did life with for years. Um, and so Pastor Jim gives me a word, which was an email um, you sent, mm -hmm. and it was just encouraging me that the Lord has something for me, right? So that got me coming back to church, like with more hope, <laughs> you know. And so I'm sitting there. And Wednesday, we had moved back into the sanctuary, <clears throat> and um, I had had a vision uh, about. I'd sat down. I said, "Lord, what do you want to do in my life?" And I see this school, right? And and so I literally draw out this picture of what I see. Um, I, and cause I, I got to that place after you sent that email encouraging me. And I said, I just need to know, I need an anchor. I can walk towards it, grab onto and pull a word that's going to anchor me. So my words have always been anchors. I'm not, tell me, tell me, tell me my future. I, I, I don't, I don't want, I want to know something that I can pull on right. with every fiber of my being. That's not going to move cause it's anchored into right. the Lord. And so he gave me this picture of a school um, and I got home and I knew, I knew in my spirit, I drew it and I knew I had to, uh, draw it in, in, in everything. And I knew I had to frame it. 
I knew I had to frame it. So I go home, I spend, you know, it, it, it's a lot of effort for me. You might look at it and think it wasn't a lot of effort, but I spent, <laughs> you know, what seems like an hour drawing this thing and really praying and, and about what the Lord spoke to me. And, you know, you got the Word, you got the Holy Spirit, and then you have, you know, this was worship and the arts to me, which was such a big part of what we did. You have the world um, in this training center on the foundation of the fivefold ministry in the prophets and the apostles. And so, um, so I draw it and I set it on my desk for months. It's sitting there, not framed for months. And I know in me, I need to frame it. But honestly, uh, I was like, I don't want to go to Hobby Lobby. I don't want to pay to have it framed. I don't want to, <laughs> I want to avoid that store. And so I just, out of just like, uh, not willing to suffer. Then you know they pump estrogen. In the Hobby <laughs> yeah, Lobby. Well, just, I it, was it like, comes through the vents. <laughs> but in my mind, I'm like, how can I go to Hobby Lobby without taking my wife, and then That's without right. her finding out That's I went right. to Hobby Lobby That's without right. her? That's right. Anyway, so it sits there for months on my desk, and so I'm in on Wednesday night, and uh, you get this really weird word, and you say, it's "So weird, someone has something, and the Lord says you're supposed to frame it." And the moment you frame it, um, He's going to activate that word in you and he mm -hmm. says it's going to start it and i mean you didn't even finish and i'm like raising my hand that's me todd johnson's over there trying to raise his hand and i'm literally like todd put your hand down this is not one of those you know share the word thing this is my word and uh i talked with him later and we anyway we joked about it but um so i go home and i frame it <clears throat> still a public school teacher um and that's just half the story this doesn't include the story of of me dying to myself and, and letting the Lord actually have his work in me as a school teacher mm -hmm. and letting him, you know, squeeze things out of me and purify me. And so that's a whole nother story. Um, you take, you come to all school of ministry and you'll hear a lot about that. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so I frame it and I think it was within six months um, you had called and asked us to come on staff. Um, and then all of a sudden it was like there was a school here, a children's school. Um, and I was supposed to be the principal of it. <laughs> and it's funny because you asked me to do this, and the Lord tell, told this to me when he said, come be a, a, the principal, and the Lord says, it won't last. Mm -hmm. And I knew the school was going to go away, phase out, and then this ministry school was going to be birthed. Um, and that's essentially what happened. And um, so we get here. <clears throat> I come on staff. And this isn't really like it's it's in the background, but it's not on the forefront. You know, we have the other school and then, you know, we kind of we had to go through that whole navigating that situation and that kind of, you know, fizzled out, which was the Lord because we were hitting COVID and you can't have Montessori during COVID. Right? right. It was God. It was God. One hundred percent. And so um, anyway, that throws us into this whole other thing of we started talking about what can we do? And I was like, you know, we were all like ministry school. Like we, we were the building, that whole wing wasn't being used, mm -hmm. but we really prayed. And, and now every room in this, and that was a word you had, every room in the facility is being used. We need another facility. That's right. We need another facility. Send the money now. <laughs> and so, 207 IDEMA. <laughs> <laughs> so we need another facility mainly because uh, Jay and Jessica are just, you know, busting the at the seams. But um, so anyway, we, we, we pray, we, we start walking towards this. And then that's when you just said, hey, this is your dream, do it. And uh, it was like deer in headlights. I'm, I'm, I'm terrified because I need more oversight. And Pastor Tim's like, here's the keys to the house. <laughs> here's the car keys. Here, here's, here's the checkbook. You know, mm -hmm. do what you need to do. And uh, I'm terrified because I'm like, well, what's, what's the vision? What's this? And so I have to go into this real big time of prayer and seeking the Lord for what's the DNA of the house. I'm... The, the, the question in my mind when I, I was coming up with the curriculum was always, God, if someone came to the school for one year and, and after that they leave to go somewhere to do ministry, whether it's plant a church or something, what do, I, what do, what do they need to know? Mm -hmm. Like what is the most basic one-year crash course mm -hmm. on ministry and doing ministry for them to know that if they leave we could say, okay, like they have a solid foundation. That's good. And so that's when we came up with uh, the curriculum and the methodology, which I call the rabbinical discipleship methodology, whereas you pretty much live life with your instructors, a good chunk of it for a whole year. Mm -hmm. um, 
and there's two there's two avenues and and they combine it's like two sides of a coin the experiential hands-on ministry and the knowledge theological knowledge um and what we call foundational so we have the experiential or the practical and the found and the foundational and so those two things meet together to where you have the word and the spirit that's combining right. right and it's a hard thing to do because a lot of times word people get too wordy and they they don't let the spirit move and then spirit people get too spirity and they're just floating around all over the place and they have no foundation and anchoring and they're tossed by every storm that comes and so <clears throat> the problem with the word people is they're not moved at all even when a move of the spirit comes they're just rigid and so we we try to combine both yes. and um in doing that we came up with four uh classes that we you know we've we've adapted a little bit the first year we actually did 12 classes <laughs> they my gosh they got 12 classes and then we we slimmed it down to eight and um and focused more on those topics and so the four practicals are um, one is you're going to hear the learn how to hear the voice of the lord it's the foundation of who we are of what we do and what what i believe is um the most important thing in our lives as a believer you got to hear him you know it's, it's me hearing his voice that kept me on the path kept me from aborting kept me from and i'm not just talking about the written word i'm talking about the actual voice the direct voice of god spoken into my life when he told me scott you're going to columbia when he told me scott you're going to build a school when he said scott stay here at christian center you know all of those things the the, the direct voice of the lord so that's the main foundation that we start with um then we go into worship uh, and Lindy and Danya do worship, and they're amazing. John John West does our prophetic class, and then Lindy and Danya do worship, um, and, and they're again they're phenomenal with that. And then we go into intercession, which we're about to go into here soon, and Miss Karen Hudgens does that, and she's amazing. And then we go into healing and deliverance, and um, and I lead that one, uh, and and I bring in other people uh, when Jenny's schedule allows it. Our our counselor on staff, we bring in Jenny, and, and Dan Moore is going to uh, help me this year with that one as well. <laughs> so, yeah, amen. Um, and so those are our practical. So you're going to learn how to hear the voice of the Lord. How, and you just you said it earlier, getting the revelation is the easiest part. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interpreting it and implying it. Mm -hmm. That gets messy, mm -hmm. very messy. And so uh, that's important for that reason. The, the, the importance of worship in our life and the importance of prayer and then healing and delivering. And we do that, we do that one at the end so that we've like covered all our <laughs> you bases. You wound them all year and you <laughs> them at the end. Yeah. I got you. We do that one at the end because honestly, some people just, uh, they're not always ready for that class because it is like a, yeah. it's intense. It can be um, it, because when I was in school, I was a psychology major and they would do like all the, um, the personality disorders and the teacher would say you're going to hear this and think you have these because you're going to be like oh my gosh is that me it's the same thing with the healing the, the deliverance class you're going to hear everything and think you have it i said you got to process with the lord yeah. um so those are our those are our practicals then we get to the foundational um and this one this one was a little different for our house because it was getting more theological um, it was emphasizing, you know, some of them emphasized things that we do, but some of it was having to really unpack who we are and what we believe mm -hmm. and convey it theologically. And so the first one they take is our version of systematic theology, which is called Orthodox Christian belief. Now, people think Orthodox as in the Orthodox Church. Or that's not what Orthodox means, correct. Mm -hmm. uh, the correct normal belief. So when we say Orthodox Christian belief, it's like what is the biblical normal belief of, of Christianity? And it's a historical view of where the church came from to where it is now, why we believe what we believe, and some of the bigger theological concepts, which, quite frankly, this is the class that shakes a lot of people um, in a way that they weren't expecting in terms of theology in a good way. Um, you know, I was talking with one of our students who's international, and she said that class, uh, think of it as if you have the structure of a house, like the A-frame, right, the framing. And someone comes and takes it and just reorients it. I mean, your whole your whole structure of thinking, your paradigm of thinking, gets shifted into a way that aligns more with the mind of Christ and more of a biblical worldview. We do a lot of that, and 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 then we realize where we have other views that actually clash clash with the biblical view. So that's an important one. 
then we do um, spiritual formations and discipleship. And that one is more about conforming to the image of Christ. Uh, we talk about faith, humility, talk about trust. Um, then we talk a lot about suffering and how suffering is such an important part of sacrifice, um, surrender, the big things. Uh, cultivating that intimacy with the Lord, because you live from that. So that's the big discipleship class. Then we do introduction to Old Testament, because we take them through. We, we don't, it's not like a, a line upon line look at the Old Testament, but it's the story. Mm -hmm. We give you, if I can give you the story mm -hmm. in that, that framing that we were talking about of the Old Testament, then all the small stuff you'll be able to figure out. Right. But when you get the heartbeat of the Old Testament, when you understand the heart of God in the Old Testament, I see people shift like that, and they go, <clears throat> so many times they'll go from a works-based mentality yep. to a family where you say, I'm in the covenant family, and dad, you know, my, my God is my father. Yeah. And, uh, and it, it will shift people yeah. out of any works-based, um, you know, where they think they have to perform for God's love. And then we do uh, New Testament um, introduction new testament as well and that's our last course in the foundations and so those come together and it really is amazing uh how you see uh the importance of both and how students some students they don't always know what they need but some students come and they'll gravitate to a class and a class will rock them and sometimes it's a theology class sometimes it's a practical class everyone's different right i mean everyone is different and so we try to offer something for everyone um, where they're at that's going to help them. Now, we, we give them, like, I mean, open up your mouth and we pour a water spout in of information. I mean, this they just got done this last class reading, like, six books. And these are all, like, you know, kick-in-the-teeth books, like Heidi Baker's Compelled by Love. We're reading Andrew Murray's Humility. I mean, and they're reading, like, five of them in this class. Um, and we, we like to have all the speakers we can come, like Pastor Jimmy, every Monday, Pastor Jimmy does his leadership class because he comes and he talks about the practicals of life. He talks about, you know, the things that sometimes we just over-spiritualize. Mm -hmm. And he likes to bring it back to reality and say, what does this look like? You know, how do you, you know, he's bivocational. So what does it look like to be bivocational in the ministry and have a family? And, and so he, he comes in and brings so much good insight. And the students always love his class because he, he, he's a teacher at some level. Um, and he loves teaching with examples and models, and he's going to have you fold towels. And <laughs> anyway, uh, he's going to have you make your bed. <laughs> and so, d Hannah, do you still make your bed every morning? <laughs> Hannah still makes her bed every morning. Okay, right. uh, and so, and then John does a Thursday. Uh, uh, cl uh, every Thursday, we have like a prophetic debriefing, um, like a prophetic roundtable where John takes all the students and they talk about dreams they've had that week, ex prophetic encounters, and they just process. Um, and he does that all year long. And then we'll have guest speakers come in. We've had Heath Young come in. We've had Natasha. Mm -hmm. uh, she just came in and taught. We've had Ira Milligan come in. We've had, uh, I mean, we've had so many people come in. I don't want to name them because I'll probably miss a lot. Um, and so it, it really is a great experience overall. And so that's what the curriculum looks like. And, and we found, and we tweak it as we go, we found that it really is, I mean, if you trim off the fat, I mean, the classes we teach are, they're pretty much their meat, you know, as far as like there's no fat. You know, we trimmed it from 12 to 8. Yeah. So we're not getting milk here. We're no, 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 no. Well, and I want to say this because I so appreciate how you have structured this. And I'm, I'm on the backside because I'm not in the classes all the time. I'm watching the fruit of it. And to me, uh, as somebody who's been in the kingdom as long as I've been saved, a long time, 50 plus years, I, I have to measure fruit. I can't, you, know, you can be full of head knowledge. And, and yeah. Paul says, you know, the gospel is foolishness, you know, to the intellectual. And it has to be practical. It has to be manifested. I think that's the big part I see. And that's what I'm seeing from the whole team. And for us being a local congregation really helps because all the students have a place to yeah. actually practice what they're sitting in the classroom learning all day long. Yes. And they have an outlet for that. And that's for me, when I went to Bible college, it didn't have any of that. We yeah. sat in class all day long, learned theology. And, you know, when we finished school, they said, God bless you and God, good luck. And yeah. that's pretty much what happened. And so I didn't know, I didn't know what they taught me, whether it worked or not. I, I didn't know if it would actually work in the workplace or not and work in the, in the ministry or not. 
because I was trusting the theologian or the teacher, the professor, uh, who supposedly was credentialed to teach me that. Yeah. Yes, okay. But uh, a lot of times when I found in college, I found a lot of my professors had never done anything they taught. And one thing I like about us is that all our all our teachers that you've brought in there, the whole staff, they're gifted they're, in the area they teach, well, and they're, and and they're, they're doing do it. it. They're not just saying it; they're yeah. doing it. So, I, my in college adjunct professors were my favorite professors by far, because they came from a workplace where they were actually doing. If I went to business class and a business law, this guy was a lawyer in the business world. You know, he was teaching from what he did. Yeah. And when I had that professor who's never worked in the business world and never and law is all theory and i don't want theology to be theory i want it to be reality and i think y'all have done that uh, i see the fruits of it and i watch it out here and i can if i if i didn't know this congregation and i came in from outside i would start picking out who's the most gifted people in the church who's the people who probably walk in some of the great i'm most likely going to pick the students mm -hmm. and won't even know yeah. i won't know they were students i will just see that because i'll watch what they do and i'll watch the manifestation of their life and to me, that's what Jesus is measuring in the midst of all this. Are we producing this, this fruit in, in our people? Yeah. And you've done that. And I think for all of anybody that's interested in our school, there's very few places in schools that give you opportunity. They, just, they can't, especially if they're big, big schools. They can't. I mean, when you got thousands of students okay. or hundreds of students, you know, well, like when I did my prophetic class, I had 100 plus students in one night. I said, there's no way I can train these people. Yeah. I, I mean, I had, I had a little bit of help, but I said, they're going to only get a the surface yeah. understanding of what we're doing here. But when I have 20 or 30, uh, I'm practically getting them to do what they need to do, and then, then that's the fruit. I think the rabbinical model you're talking about was a disciple sitting there and do that. Yeah, and, and that's what we do. So, yeah. like, our, our prophetic class is partnered with our prophetic flexes. There you go. Where in, in, in our handbook, you have to have, and, you know, we have it in there as a guideline, but you're going to get way more. But you have to have 12 hours of out-of-class, hands-on ministry yeah. in that area. But you're going to get it just by yeah, coming to Christian, by, right. by coming here. <laughs> well, and you don't even have to, we've had people who don't even come to Christian right, Center. Right. You don't have to even, you can, be a, still you can be at a church here, and we always encourage you, stay and serve where you're at. But if you want to come equip you and yeah. your pastors are okay, we're fine right. with it. Right. And we're not going to pull on you to come here. But, uh, and we have people who go to other churches who come to our school. But we have events at night, like the Prophetic Flex, and you're going to get we're not just going to talk about it. You're going to get hands-on experience. Yeah. Like we just had a cleansing fire a couple months ago and one of the students came and she shadowed in one of the rooms. And afterwards she's like, I learned more in that shadow, like watching y'all than yeah. I have so many questions yeah. and oh my gosh, and this and that. And she was excited. Right. And so what she, when she takes a class, she's going to be actually, and she, she, we had her step in cause I was like, she's carrying stuff. So she stepped in and did some ministry there. But that's the hands-on they get where it's like they do it. And, and it's funny that that's where theory is easy. Knowledge is easy. But when we say, okay, now do it, that's where the shaking and they're like, uh, 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 you know, go, go sing, go, go pray, go, go minister. And, the, and so, you know, behind them, we're like, you have everything. You know, we're confident. We're not going to ask you to do something we don't think you're able to. We're going to ask you something that's going to be a challenge. Well, I, think, I think that's a great point because you're not asking the students to do anything you've not put in them and they haven't okay. watched us that's do right. that's and, right yeah. so i for me uh, that's how i learned to prophesy i had a pastor who saw the gift on me i had hungered for it i prayed for it i believed i had it and he would stick a microphone in my mouth and say prophesy yeah. and i'm like <laughs> i was scared and my first prophecies for the worst prophecies you probably ever have you know jesus loves you you know uh, god loves the world you know those were kind of my prophecies <laughs> that i had because i was scared but I realize he saw something that I didn't see in myself. And I think for our teaching staff here, because uh, I've talked to you guys about the students, I mean, you're telling me their strengths, their weaknesses. You, 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 because you are community and you're with them every day, you see that. Yeah. And, and I know we're almost out of time, but one thing I, I do, I don't, you probably don't know I do this, but I, I quiz all the students and I go around and say, hey, what was the best part of the class mm -hmm. for you? What, what was the what was your thing that you take away? I ask them questions like that because I think that's very important. And they all have different answers. I mean, it's never a consistent same thing with everybody because I think everybody comes with some need here yeah. in their life to be fulfilled through the, the school. But I think the number one, I guess, consistent thing is that they love the teachers, and they do. They tell me that. 
it was so good to get to know them because you know when you go to a congregation you watch teachers preachers whatever you see them from a distance you know you know them yeah they may say hi to you you may go out to lunch with them occasionally but the fact that when you're seeing somebody every day yeah and they're telling you their life story and how they accomplish what they accomplish i think that's anybody's story when you're studying business or studying anything how'd you get where you are you know what was that journey and it demystifies this whole thing about well you just woke up one day and started doing that yeah. you, you didn't you learned along and i think we're teaching the students that here obviously you are i know you are because i'm, I'm seeing the fruit of that and then the fact that they connect with our professors or teachers whatever you want to call us and i think that's important because then they're real and it's attainable yeah. i think so many times when i when i was starting as young pastor i i'd try to tell people what jesus was doing and i'd have people tell me this even leaders well that's jesus that's not me, you know, and they, they, they saw it as unattainable. And I thought, Lord, how do I make it attainable? How do I make it where they recognize they can do? And I think for my story and, and, and all our stories is that God took us from nothing yeah. and he made us great. He yes. made us who he wanted us, not just great in the eyes of men, but great in his eyes. Yeah. And we go after that because of his goodness and we're thankful yeah. for that and we thank him for that. But the fact is he uses vessels that are willing I yeah. always say that. And our school has done that. We find willing vessels. Yeah. And I think of some of the, even the older students, I say older, you know, 40s, 50s, whatever, that have come, you know, it seems kind of silly. Why are you going to school at 40, 50 years old? Why would you do that? You know, you, you're already in your career or you had kids, your family, whatever. But they are the ones I think sometimes get more out of they it, love than, it than anybody else. And it's else. amazing to see their connection with, like, the 19-year-olds. And it. it's like you wouldn't even know no. there were two generations apart. No, and I, and I love that. And I love that for what y'all have done and what we've done here. Again, they, these guys make me look good. You make me look good. And I appreciate that. But, you know, I, I think I learned through pain and trial that if – if I have to be the focus all the time, then I will be the focus all the time. And then the ministry is not about that. I don't want it to be said, Christian Center, oh, that's, that's Tim Karskadden's church. I, I want it to be said that, wow, that's, that's a church where they have multiple leaders, they have multiple voices there, they have multiple things, because that's the kingdom. Yeah. To me, the kingdom is a, a, a many-membered body. In 1 Corinthians 12, I have just studied that to no end about the different parts of the body and how important it is. And for me... I look around like Hannah sitting here, and she's, you know, my board stiff. Listen to us, but uh, I'm teasing. But you know, she's she's got her fingers on the button. She's doing all this. I'm I'm ready to honor that yeah. because what we're saying is irrelevant if she's not doing what she's yeah. she's doing there. And and that to me, I've always been big because I've been this person. I've been that person right there that did all those things, and I didn't do it to get here. Yeah. I did it there because I love serving yeah. and I love doing that. And I think that's why God promotes. If you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, no, he will lift you up. And I think that's, to me, if I could say I want any mantra or whatever in our ministry is that serve. Yeah. God will open the doors it's of opportunity. Of our values. To the point, you'll get to where I, I, I got too much to do. I, 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 matter of fact, I got to start saying no to things because God opens those doors of opportunity that way. Well, and everything is a trickle down. I mean, Olive is what you built through 30 years of pain, <laughs> tears, and <laughs> celebration with the Lord. <laughs> and so, you know, we're just, we just step into what you guys have been building. And, and I talked, you know, in our interview with Natasha, we mentioned it, like, um, we honor what has been built here over the years and what you paid the price yeah. to build. And, and, so, and I walked in, hey, mm -hmm. look, I walked into what other people built yeah. too. And I, I always, the, my statement is this, Lord gave me this phrase. It's one song and we all have our own verse. Yeah. And I think that it's not a new song. It's the same song. It's just a new verse. And your life is a verse. And my life is a verse. But they, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all those who went before us, they wrote the song, in a sense, with the Lord's help. The Lord wrote the song, ultimately. But we're just adding to this song, song along the way. And I think the arrogance of um, thinking that you started something or you birthed something, I understand, I understand what that means. But yeah. the, the fact is that that it went on before there's a, a guy there's a movie if you ever get to see it, it's called a guy named joe and it's with spencer tracy it's an old movie and he dies and he goes to heaven and he's a pilot and he's he thought he's a hot shot pilot and he dies in a, in a plane crash and he goes to heaven and they teach him that the only reason you can fly is because of these guys and he takes them through the whole history of flying 
and the first guys that you know that, that put a wing on a, on an instrument and tried to fly on oh, no, it takes him through this whole thing and how the fact is we are not anything except for those who go before us and when we read the last verse of hebrews 11 with those people who didn't mm -hmm. see what was promised they're perfected by us finishing what they started i think that's the critical part of what that's to me apostolic i'm yeah. finishing what somebody else started. Jesus obviously put it all together. Not trying to hijack it and make no, it about you. No. And we've tried to build that culture here. I mean, pride is pride. I think uh, uh, Ira did a good job, but Teach Ira Milligan did about that. You're going to have mixed motives eventually. Well, he ultimately. says no one ever starts out with pure motives. <laughs> no. The Lord purifies you as you <laughs> that's, go. That's right. And we just try to do that. And, that. and that's humility. I think, you know, Andrew Murray book, he talked about humility. I've I, I used to give that for Father's Day to people, you know, it's like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you give us something, you know, encouraging? It is encouraging to me to understand that humility is the foundation of all that we do. And right now, the prophetic word we're getting uh, for this next season is humility is going to have to be there. Otherwise, we won't be able to build what God's yeah. building because God is not going to let man be exalted in this yeah. hour. He never has been, but especially in this hour. There were times where he'd let a man be the focus but no more and, and i that's think that there's about to be such a need in the body that if you don't have this model you're not going to make it you're going to burn your pastors out now, there's many prophetic words about that so well, well we better we ought to close so Amen. thanks for having me here today. no thanks for coming pastor tim <laughs> he's the uh, senior pastor at christian center street that means i'm old right? <laughs> he's he's the leader he's the head of the the, the ministry uh and then um he's the president of olive and so in olive and christian center are essentially one entity yeah, we absolutely all the olive students uh who who come to christian center because you can come without like we mentioned but if you come to christian center we, we plug you in on sundays that's as well right. to serve that's and, right. and we try to say hey you know because serving is such an important role even in areas you don't that's initially right. want whether that's it's right. greeting media uh healing ministries um or ch children care but you need to i think i've looked at business owners i, I i've met business owners who like they own a restaurant mm -hmm. And I said, where'd you start? Uh, washing dishes. And, and what that does as an owner, it, you put value on every job because you went there. If you came in as the top guy and you never worked your way in the system or understood the system in any way, then there's no way you can relate to that person back there washing dishes. And when I see that, they have some of the most successful businesses because they understood the concept of what every piece and how every piece is yeah. important. And we believe that for every human that comes here, that loves the Lord Jesus Christ, they're an intricate piece of the kingdom of God. And we just have to put their in, in their right place and watch them help build, edify the church. Until that unity, it talks about there in that chat, until the unity of the faith. And the fact that we've not seen that tells me we have not fulfilled this mandate yet. It. So we're, we're getting there, so all the the cessationists said we've done that i think they're wrong we've not made it there yet we're not we're working on it. we're not united but we're on our way Amen. so right. thank you guys for watching thank you for tuning in um remember we have our ccs app that you can download if you want to connect with the church pastor tim has his podcast please listen to that you can find that on the app and then this podcast the whole purpose of it is to showcase some of the guest speakers we have with olive uh, that's the experience part. But then we have a part where we'll just talk about themes and topics that we want to break down and discuss a little more and bring the, the foundational knowledge aspects as well, like why does theology matter when you have experience. So we'll talk about that as well. So thank you guys so much for watching. Please like this. It just helps you know with the algorithms and get us exposure. Share it um, and subscribe. So thank you guys for tuning in, and we hope you guys have a blessed day.